Hello, and welcome to Unabridged, the weekly podcast where teachers take on books. This is Sarah. Join us for bookish episodes and a monthly book club pick. This is Ashley. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod, or go to our website, unabridgedpod.com, where the books we read are linked for purchase. This is Jen. Check out our Teachers Pay Teachers store, our Patreon page, and our newsletter. Please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts to support us. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 180. Today is our June Book Club episode on Laura Taylor Namie's A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea and Tomorrow. We wanted to remind you that we are on social media, so check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at Unabridged Pod on those social media outlets. And also don't forget to check out our website at www.unapproachedpod.com. Before we get started with our discussion of the book, let's do our bookish check-in. Ashley, what are you reading today? So this one just came out yesterday. So I was reading this a little in advance with NetGalley. I'm reading an e-copy, so I'm happy to do that. And this is, this is Farida Abike Amy Day's Ace of Spades. And I was really compelled to read this one. I was excited when I saw the promos for it because it takes place at a private school. It has a lot of things going on and it just looked really compelling. And so I haven't read very much of it yet, but I am really interested in the characters. It has two protagonists who thus far have very different lives and are not particularly intertwined. So there's Devin and there's Chiamaka. And they both are at this elite private school together, but Devin is there on scholarship. He's very aware of how different he is from a lot of the other students. And he tries to keep a low profile. So he is not very well known. And on the other side of things, Chiamaka is the center of the social world at the school. And she is very aware of that. So she's a fascinating character to see into her mind as a protagonist because she is cold and calculating. She has a very tight friend group, but does not see them as friends. She is very aware of how they use each other for social status. And every move that she makes is carefully calculated and she is extremely popular extremely talented she's very intelligent and so she is very determined to climb every ladder so that she can be at the very top but right in the opening part of the book there's the ceremony at the beginning of their senior year and they are announcing the prefects and kind of the head basically the people who are going to be the head of the school government. And she, of course, is the lead of that group, which is no surprise to anyone. But then Devin's name is called. And I mean, his friend has to kind of tap him and be like, get up. That was your name. And you have to get up because he cannot fathom why he's been chosen for this when it's clearly a popularity contest. And again, he tries to keep a low profile. He feels like no one knows who he is. So he can't fathom why this is happening. So that happens right at the beginning. And from there, we start to learn that both of them have some pretty substantial secrets that they do not want other people to know. And yet those secrets are becoming known in, in a mysterious way. And so We see that happening to Devin first, that a photo is revealed that he doesn't know who has leaked the photo, but it shows him with another guy and they're together. He thinks at first that the other guy had leaked it on purpose because they had broken up, but the other guy's clearly clueless too. So it becomes this question for him of, why is this happening? And there are some things at stake for him. He doesn't really want his sexuality to be open to everyone. And so there's his desire to, again, keep a low profile and stay out of the spotlight. And this is shoving him directly into the spotlight. And he is concerned about what those ramifications are going to be. And so we see that happening. And then simultaneously, we find out that Chiamaka has this really troubling secret that she and another student had happen that she is trying to hide. 
So there's a lot of, I think the the mood is really great in this and there's a lot of tension and it's unclear why events are coming to play the way that they are, but there's a feeling that there's someone who is pulling some strings and making a lot of things happen on purpose. And so it's really interesting so far and I am interested to see what happens. So again, that's a brand new release. It just came out yesterday. And I think it's going to be a great read. It's young adult. And it is Farida Abike Iemide's Ace of Spades. I really would like to read it. I'm, I'm reading it now as well. And it's very intriguing. I'm doing the Ashley thing and I'm reading like six books. It's fine. <laughs> That's what I saw that Jen posted and I was like, oh, I'm reading that too. <laughs> so I was excited that we're both reading it and I'm looking forward to talking about it. Jen, what are you reading? So one of the other books I am reading right now, I am listening to Isabel Wilkerson's cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. So my real life book club chose this as their May book. And then I'm also doing a side buddy read, a read to learn buddy read with Tony in June about this one. So, and it is narrated by Robin Miles, who is fantastic. So Wilkerson is the author of The Warmth of Other Suns, which I talked about at the very beginning of 2021. And that was a historical, primarily historical book. And this one has history in it as well. But it is also, I would say it's sociological. So it is looking at the function of caste in our society, the way that we have put Black Americans at the bottom of society. And it is comparing it to the caste system of India and to the very deliberate way that the Germans built a caste system to put Jews at the bottom between World War I and World War II. And there are some parts of it that I'm familiar with already, but what I think Wilkerson is doing that is really new that I haven't seen before is she is looking at the way these different countries studied each other's caste systems to make theirs more effective. I had no idea that the Germans studied the American caste system that is not called a caste system to build theirs in Germany before World War II, that they looked at our laws to figure out ways to denigrate Jew the Jewish population. I had no idea. I didn't know that either, Jen. Wow. It, it is that chapter. I was driving when I was listening to that chapter and it made me gasp. I just had, yeah, I, I don't know why that one hit me so hard, but it really did. And she talks also about the pillars of caste and what societies have to do to make caste systems stick so that it's more than just legal, but it's the way that the people in the society think about the way their society is structured. And then she intersperses that with personal stories and anecdotes of times that caste has impacted her or people she knows or people from history. So it's this amazing blend of the personal and the societal and the global that I am finding really fascinating. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. I always have that regret with nonfiction that's really fascinating that I'm listening because a lot of things are having impact. But of course, I don't have, you know, the attention to detail that I do when I read it in print. But I'm also so glad to be reading it. And again, Robin Miles is a fantastic narrator. So that is Isabel Wilkerson's cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, which I am just learning so much from. Wow, that sounds great, too. I think I've seen that all over Instagram, and I would like to read it. I think I would like it on, on audio, because I like to read nonfiction on audio. Yeah, so yeah it's really. Out. And because she has those stories in between. So it is dense, but it's not. It, she is a great storyteller of history, and so I think it works really well on audio. Yeah. Awesome. What are you reading, Sarah? Well, this is a book that I started a long time ago, and then I got sidetracked with other <laughs> things. And then I had some at some point I had put it on hold at my library, the audiobook, and it the audio came in. And so because it had said like you will get this in four months or whatever. So I just forgot about it. Well, it came in. So this is Sarah Morgenthaler's The Tourist Attraction. So I restarted it and listened to it. And I, um, I'm i not going to go into great detail because we've talked about it several times because both Jen and Ashley have already read it. It's about a kind of a grumpy guy who lives in this tourist town in Alaska. And he has this restaurant where he basically treats the patrons of his restaurant horribly. And they're like, this is great. And they come back for more. So his name is Graham. 
And then there is Zoe, who is a travel, who has traveled to Alaska and she's basically saved up all of her money over lots of years. And this is her like major vacation of a lifetime. And, you know, there's, there's some drama, there's some love and there's a moose who <laughs> is the kind of the mascot of the town. And it's just, it's just a great light read. And I think here for summer, it's a great, it would be a great beach read. And I think anybody that enjoys romance and it's not a huge emotional investment, but it's just a fun read. And I think it's great for the summertime. So that is Sarah Morgenthaler's the tourist attraction. It is actually the first in a series. And I actually, the second one is Mistletoe and Mr. Right. And I actually put that on hold at my library. And if it comes in this summer, I will be reading the holiday book in the summer because I'm just interested to be back with these characters. So it, it's really sweet. I like it a lot. Yeah, that's such a great read. And the series is so, I liked all the books. I really did. I thought, I think I talked about when I, I don't remember which one I talked about this, but just that sense of a town and that you're returning to the town and the community. And so you have these characters who are returning. I really love when that's done well in a series. And I just found myself too, like laughing at some things. I mean, she just has some, there's wit and I just really like it. So, And again, I'm not, I was trying, I wanted to read something without a lot of emotional, you know, real estate being taken up. So it's been perfect for that. Okay, we are now going to get into our discussion of Laura Taylor Namie's A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea and Tomorrow. Before we actually start our discussion, I wanted to just read a quick summary. This is a YA book, and here's the summary. The plan for Lila Reyes has always been to graduate high school and become the head baker at her Abuela's pastry shop in Miami. However, when three traumatic life events occur... Leela's parents send her to England for the summer against her wishes. As Leela makes friends and becomes part of the community of Winchester, England, she slowly finds herself, friendship, and love in the small English town. So let's talk about overall impressions. Jen, what was your overall impression of this novel? I really love this. I, I knew when we chose it that I would like it. But I loved it more than I expected. The cover is very much focused on this beautiful young couple. And while there is definitely a romance that runs through the story, I think I really loved the fact that it is that Naomi makes it about so much more than just the central romance. And she builds Leela as a really strong character who is a very complicated character. She is at a time in her life when things would be changing anyway, but because she calls it the trifecta, because the trifecta occurred, her abuela died, her best friend, basically she feels ended their friendship and her boyfriend broke up with her all very close together. She is contending with more change than most kids that age contend with. And so I thought it was just a really rich story. And I loved the way that Naomi used this change in setting to make Leela reflect on who she is and on what matters. And she loved her abuela so much that she's a huge part of her identity. And so in some ways, leaving Miami is mirroring leaving abuela and is making her think about how she can go on without her. I just, yeah, I, I could go on and on. I feel like I'm already pretty rambly, but I really, really loved it overall. Yeah. How about you, Ashley? Yep. I, I thought it was strong to start with and I liked it. And then the farther that I got into the book, the more I loved it. And I think particularly with this kind of book that is hard to do a lot of times with romance novels, I find that I really love them, but I get a little worn out in some ways toward the end. And this one, I just felt like got stronger and stronger. And I loved what Naomi developed the farther I got into the book. So ultimately, I absolutely loved it and thought it was really phenomenal about a lot of different topics that, like Jen said, she's able to touch on that goes so far beyond the kind of typical teen romance experience that can be fun to read about. But this one surpasses that in so many ways. And I thought that all worked really, really well. Yes. What about you, Sarah? 
Yeah, I mean, I just have to say ditto because <laughs> it, I just, it was not what I expected from the cover. I thought, and like you said, Jen, I thought I would like it, but I did not realize how much I was going to love it. And I, and also, like you said, Ashley, the further and further I got into it, the more I just fell in love with these characters and the sense of family. And I just think that Naomi is just so good at writing like when you're in that moment when you've graduated from high school and you're trying to find yourself but also you're holding on to the things that mattered to you and I mean it's hard it's really hard and I think she captures that so well in the book so yeah I just I adored it and by the end I just wanted to it was one of those ones I just wanted to hug because I thought yeah she did so well and I think she does a really good job at, at describing grief and how it's such it's like a road it's not something that is finite it's just a something that you are you always carry with you and I, I just thought it was all really lovely I loved it so oh my yeah. gosh I just started to get weepy because I was just thinking about how when the first time someone tells her she needs a sweater and that flashes back to Abuela saying that to her so many times and the way grief can sneak up on you in these little tiny moments and that it doesn't take much to bring back that vividness of the person you've lost. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I just, well, there was a part in the book where she, where Leela and Kate, her, who she's staying with, are they're having this conversation. And I thought like to the point where I was saying about trying to leave what you, what you were behind and become who you are going to be. And at the very end, Kate is also Cuban and she's from, Miami and she has this strong sense of family, but she, she marries and her husband, Spencer, the English guy, and she moves to England and makes a life there. And Leela says something to the effect of, uh, when did you start, when did you stop missing your family and what you had in Miami? And Kate says any minute now. And I mean, I just thought that was so impactful because it's, it's not that you're unhappy in your old, your new life, but you mm -hmm. still have those ties to your to what who you were. And I just thought that was really beautiful. And so I think that Naomi does such a good job of describing those complex things that happen as especially as you're growing up and you make choices. And just because you make one choice doesn't mean you forget about what you're leaving behind. I just thought it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Guys, I feel like I might. <laughs> I might, I might cry. I'm just feeling very, you know. Yeah. I couldn't say anything over here because I was kind of choking. So. I, know. <laughs> I found that scene very impactful. Oh, my yes. gosh. Yes. I think we all know that there were a lot of things that worked for us. So, but can each of us, let's each of us just pick one thing that really like worked for us, maybe that we found unexpected or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, Ashley, what is something that worked for you? Yeah, I think just building on what you said, Sarah, about that scene with Kate and Leela, what I really loved was the attachment to place and how our home is not just our people, but also our place. And so she has this attachment to Miami and she's in love with Miami as a city and in some ways feels the exact same feelings you have of she feels that she's betraying Miami when she starts to love Winchester and feels that she's betraying Miami when she starts wearing the sweaters and the clothes that Pilar sends for her. She feels that she is turning away from her loved one. And I thought all of that was just really rich because Naomi does such a great job of encapsulating how our culture and our family is also tied to a sense of place and that we have to find a way to carry those things with us. And yet that's never going to be the same as being in the place, but that doesn't mean that you should never leave the place. And I think all of that was just really richly done. And that scene with Kate, I told them before we started recording that when I was reading that scene, I had just put on my makeup and I was getting ready for work. And I just had to like lean over so that my tears would fall onto the floor directly <laughs> so that it would not, so my makeup would not run down my face. I was like, I cannot redo my makeup. I cannot redo. I'm not redoing this this morning. I've got to get out the door. And I think it was just overwhelming. And I mean, I am traveling a lot right now. And so I feel that impact. But I think also in our lives, my life partner and I have traveled a lot and you never 
stop missing the places that you have been from. And so I think that's what I really appreciate is her trying to find a way and knowing that no matter what pathway she chooses, her heart will hurt in some ways and that that's okay. I think that that was part of what I found really lovely about the book is that there isn't a simple answer and mm -hmm. everything doesn't just work out because once you love multiple people in multiple places, you're always going to feel that. And so I just, all of that really worked for me. I thought, again, the connection, not just to people, but also to place and what that does for us as individuals was really powerful. Jen, what worked for you? So I'm really torn between two things. I think I want to talk about uh, the friendship facet of this book, because I thought that was really done. And in some ways, I think the romance and her grieving for Abuela stood out more in the front of my head when I think about this book. But I think the friendship is a really rich part of it. So her friend, Stephanie, they had planned to be together in Miami after graduation, and they had all of these plans. And Stephanie had been making alternate plans to go to Ghana for a long time, for months, and had not told Leela. And Leela feels really betrayed and is trying to understand, but just feels as if Stephanie was lying to her and that by making this choice, she is saying she doesn't want to be friends with Leela anymore. And so one of the really vivid parts of the book it, for me is when she's in Winchester and she's gradually letting in these new friends who are helping her to understand herself. And I love Leela because she is such a strong character, but she starts to see the way that sometimes her strength can overshadow the people that she loves. So Stephanie says that the reason she couldn't tell Leela about these plans is because Leela would have persuaded her to stay and not to do this thing that she dreamed about. And she discovers that her boyfriend had broken up with her because her personality was so strong that he felt like he couldn't understand who he was. And so I, I really appreciated watching Leela make these new friendships where she is complimenting people with her strength rather than overshadowing them and opening her world a little bit in ways that I thought were really rich. And I do think sometimes when you have a best friend in high school, you feel like that person is your person and there's not really space for other friendships. And so to see her learn that she can have different types of friendships with different people and that she can fulfill different roles for people. I, I just really thought all of that was really realistic, really well done, really important part of growing up and figuring out who we are. And also that that part of her identity was becoming clearer for her, how she could kind of navigate that strength and, and temper it a little bit. So, yeah, that. I, that really worked for me. I think that both what you said, Ashley, and what you said, Jen, that it just really resonates because I think that also like with place, unlike you, Ashley, I've been, I've mostly lived my life where I grew up. And I think that, that it can be a blessing and a curse at times because it, the longer you're there, the more it is difficult to think about going someplace else because you have this comfort. And I really, re it really resonated with me with Leela wrestling with that, even though she's mm -hmm. much younger than I am, but having that strong sense of family and community and not wanting to leave, but then finding something that is amazing somewhere else. I just really, I mean, it's almost like I resonated with that, but I could, it was almost like a, a yearning that you feel like, because trying to take that leap and do something like that is, is difficult, but then the reward is worth it. So I thought that was really powerful. And then with the friendships, I think a lot of times you feel like when you're in high school, you feel like these people are going to be your people forever and ever. And then it is so hard to see past that. And then, then when, once you become an adult, I mean, oftentimes you find your true people, you know, because you get to meet lots of different people when you, the older you get. And I just think that, I think she does such a good job of putting into words the way it feels when you are kind of breaking those, those strong bonds and that you will still be in each other's lives, but not the in the same way you were. It just makes me want to just sob because I just think she perfectly captures that in between when you're mm -hmm. in between being a child and, a, and an adult. And she does such a good job with that. Yeah. Sarah, what worked for you? I'm going to go with um, something that was m more minor than what you all were talking about, but what really, something that really resonated with me was Leela's relationship with Flora Orion's 
younger sister and Orion and, and his dad and his sister are going through this really difficult time of his, his mom having early onset dementia and trying to navigate that. And I thought that was all so well done as well. And Flora is 15. She's trying to find her way. She doesn't have her mom. And Leela sees her vandalizing something. And uh, and instead of, you know, telling on her or, or making this huge deal, she takes her under her wing. And they build this lovely friendship and almost mentor, mentor and mentee. And I just, I wanted to sob during that whole part where she basically Flora doesn't want to, doesn't want to have this mentor mentee relationship at the beginning. So Leela tells her that she, that, that she won't tell her Ryan that she found her doing this vandalism if she comes and helps her in the in the inn where she is running the kitchen for Kate and Spencer. And Flora comes and does it like under duress, does not want to. And she ruins some pastry. And Leela is like, we have to serve it. And then Kate comes in and is, well, she knows that it's not Leela, but she addresses Leela and Leela takes the blame. And Flora sees all this stuff. And Leela is so mature. I think based on the way that she the the responsibility she had in her family business and all the things that she is going through, she sees Flora for who she is. And so she, when she takes that, takes the heat for the ruined pastries and Flora observes that and all that whole that just that whole thing where they where Flora realizes that Leela is looking out for her and then she starts trying I just thought it all seemed very authentic I thought it seemed it built in a way that I thought was really beautiful and I just loved Leela's character and that she saw this young girl who was grasping for something and losing her mom I just thought it was beautiful and I loved that relationship and how it progressed throughout the book and how they became, how, how Leela became this huge person for Flora. And then at the end, when Leela gives Flora her Abrela's necklace, I, I just was, I just thought there were so many parts where I just wanted to sob because I thought it was just so beautiful and touching. So that's mine. It's the relationship between Flora and Leela. Yeah. Yeah. I loved how Leela had come to realize that she steamrolled some of her friends and that moment where she realized about Stephanie and the running and how she never, um, I mean, I'm terrible. My friends know I'm terrible about steamrolling things. And that moment where you're, you know, the light bulb comes on and you're like, oh my God, they've been trying to say that she's tried to tell me this over and over and over again. And I never heard her and then we see how powerful on the other hand that same command can be Mm -hmm. when it's handled in a way that supports instead of hindering and i just thought all of that was so rich because i think that is we are all in that work in progress as people and Certainly, I don't think I was anywhere near that mature at that age, but it is a struggle I continue to have is how do you, how do you use the parts of your, we cannot change our personalities entirely. So how do we use what we have (laughs) in a way that we hope helps the people around us and the people we love instead of hurting them? And I just thought all of that was so rich and with Andres too, that like, even through all of her hurt with him that she could realize that about herself Mm -hmm. and take that in and then be able to move forward. And then I love how with Flora and I mean that scene, Sarah, where she just really owns it and, and is apologetic. And I just thought was so well, yeah, just so well done. I was absolutely, that was why, like I said in the beginning, I just felt like the book got stronger and stronger for me. And it was those things that, the first part I was like, ah, oh, you know, but then when it, when it developed and you saw how it tied together, mm-hmm. I thought that was really amazing. Can I say one more thing? And I know this is cheating. I just want to mention, I <laughs> loved the way Leela's relationship with her sister and her parents was in the background of most of the book. Mm-hmm. And that I think I'm conditioned in some ways to feel like if she's loving these people, she must be 
there's some big conflict with the people she's left at home. And certainly she was upset with them because they sent her to England against her will. But her love for her sister, for Pilar, never wavers. It is always there in the background. And you see the affection between them. They are very different. It's not that because she was best friends with Stephanie, she couldn't also have a strong sister relationship. I just think Naomi does such a good job of acknowledging the breadth of people we need in our lives to be healthy people. Mm -hmm. And you have to make choices, but it doesn't mean you're choosing one person over another. And I just thought that I didn't want to not mention her sister and her parents because they are there in the background, even though they are not at the forefront of the choices she's making in the book. Sorry. Cheating. No, that's cheating okay. Over. Yeah, I like that too. I know. I want to keep going too. It's <laughs> funny because I just I just want to mention one more scene. I loved that scene with the Cuban music oh when they were gosh. cooking in the kitchen together yes. and dancing. I just thought that I hope this becomes a movie and I think that would be such a beautiful scene. But I loved how you just see her coming into herself and how as she does that, she lights up the people around her. And I just absolutely loved that. And I believed it. I believed mm -hmm. that as she learned to heal, but also to accept the ways in which she would not heal, that she could bring this beauty to the people around her. I just thought yeah. that scene was just phenomenal. That one really stood out to me. And then the one where they had the conversation about missing Miami. Mm -hmm. I just thought all of that was just masterful. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. All right. Well, I think it's no secret that there are a lot of things that worked for us in this book and we could go on and on, but we're going to move to, and I think that we probably could all have like a lot of quotes to discuss <laughs> yes. because it's just, she just does a really good job of capturing things in words. I think mm -hmm. that and expressing things that are happening with this beautiful, these, this beautiful language. So I think that we could all take a bunch of quotes, but we're each going to just do one. Uh, Jen, what is your quote? So I chose one. This is at the end of the book when Leela's dad asks her if Orion loves her. And she says, I close my eyes as inner snapshots flip. Orion Maxwell has never said the words, but he's also shouted them a million ways, a million times. And I think this book does such a good job of showing how love is something that we enact, that we show through actions. I think that Leela is doing that every time she's cooking for her friends and for Orion and for her family. I think that Orion does that every time he has the sweater so she won't get cold and he just makes sure that she's taken care of. And it's in those little details that I think Naomi builds realistic, believable relationships. It is a long time before Leela and Orion even admit to themselves their feelings for each other. And yet we have seen it through their actions for so long. And it's not, I don't know, it's not cheesy. It's not over the top. It is so sweet and so sincere and so thoughtful. And yeah, I just really, really loved that demonstration of the way people show that they care for each other. I feel like Orion and Leela are both very mature for their age, but I think it works because you see how much responsibility both of them have in their end like independently. And then, but I, but I do, I, while I was reading, I was like, have they kissed? Because like, I did the same thing. <laughs> because they, and you know, they show each other they that how much love they have for each other in so many ways. But I mean, there is no really intimacy or anything like that for a very, very long time. And so, I, yeah, I think that is a great example of a, an excellent quote for this book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, I know what yours is, and this was one of mine, too. So, Ashley, what is your quote? Yeah, I was going to say that. I think all three of us had <laughs> this one or something very similar for yes. her relationship with Abuela. So, we there's so many things we could discuss in this book, but... For sure, her relationship to her abuela is central to who she is as a person. And we see that throughout the book. And that is definitely part of why that trifecta of loss hit her so hard. And so this is one example of that, this passage. For me, she had to rest where I could hold her forever, a heart home warm and worthy of her. I decided to leave her where I found her. I left her where she found me as a toddler at her feet with a clanging set of measuring spoons. 
I left her where she grew me. No, not in a white coffin and not in a long-term care facility. I left my abuelita in the kitchen. And I think that why that was so powerful to me is that for one thing, there's just not a right way to grieve. And I think that that this book shows how different people hurt in different ways and different people learn to carry that in different ways. And so I loved how I think we see that with her. We see that with Orion and the way that he deals with his mom, that there's not one way to be and that we just have to take it as it comes. And I just think all of that's really rich. And also, like I said, I think what I love is that that relationship is central to her as a person. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it. And I think it just really shows the way that we carry the people we love in everything that we do. And every time she makes food, and that's why I love that scene with the music and her friends, because not only was she there, but her abuela was there. And I just think like that is so beautiful. And the book does that so well in a way that I don't see in YA a lot. I think I see that we see loss, but I think we don't always see how we carry our heritage and our ancestors with us in our journey. But I think that that is so beautiful and something that I want teens to see. And then I sometimes think, I think in our culture, we've talked about this before, but a lot of times in America, we try to just not talk about loss. And I think that we do that because it doesn't hurt so much. But then I think sometimes we then are looking away from some of the things that would bring us some healing Mm -hmm. if we could embrace them. And I think that's what she's doing there. She just really is embracing that it's okay to hurt, but it's also okay to move forward and to carry on with this beautiful thing that her abuela taught her to be. And so, yeah, I just absolutely loved all of that. And I I wanted to say too, that I feel like we are all, I feel very teary talking about it, but the book is beautiful and it is not heavy. So even though I think it is very poignant, and I felt a lot of positive emotion. Like I, So I just wanted to say that, that I think that as we discuss, some of these things might sound heavy, but in a lot of ways, the book is not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's lovely. Agree. It's joyful. But it yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, it's joyful. It's, it's mm-hmm. joyful. And it's joyful even in the midst of sadness. And I think that's what I really liked about it. Yes. I love that term heart home. Like I've never... I never thought of it that way, but that's truly what it is. And I just, I, when I read that, I was like, that is what it is. Like the people that you carry with you in your heart home. I just think that's beautiful. Yeah. That's what I'm glad you said that Sarah about it being joyful, because I think that's it is that even though the things are hard because life is hard and we never get over those losses. And yet Naomi shows a way that we can make that we can embrace that as part of a whole, instead of trying to turn away from it. I think in a lot of ways, I expect, I think that's why this book was unexpected to me, Mm -hmm. is in a lot of ways, when she went to England, I expected her to love it. I did not expect that she would love it, but find a way to embrace it and all the other things that she carried as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really worked. With that, that quote and what you were saying about like her exploring grief with Orion and his mom, and then Leela and her abuela. And I just thought... That conversation that Orion, after Leela goes with Orion to visit his mom and afterwards she's like wrestling with all these things and he's, and he's asking her what she's doing and has having an internal wrestling and he's asking her and she, I mean, like, you know, she voices what a lot of us maybe think, but we, it's hard to verbalize. And she asks about which is worse, like Abuela dies suddenly from a heart attack and she finds her and then his mom is slowly he's slowly losing his mom because she doesn't remember him and I just thought that all was really like I mean verbalizing that it's like what you said Ashley a lot of times we don't say those things because we're afraid of what you know of what people will think or it's just not it's just not okay it feels like it's not okay to talk about those things but those are things we should be able to talk about and and verbalize and and wrestle with and mm-hmm. I just thought that was wonderful that they were able to have that and talk about it and I mean both are equal both are horrible and it it's right. just being able to talk about that with someone I think that's really important yeah I loved that team Sarah what was your quote so my quote I just felt like this quote embodied Leela as a person so that's why I picked it it was early in the book and I as soon as when I read it I I 
automatically marked it. And I do think there are some quotes like the ones about Abuela that are, are maybe more like kind of touch your heart more. Mm-hmm. But I just love this quote because Leela is such a strong character and she is not without flaws, but she is determined. And I love, I loved her and I love her for young women to be able to read. And so the quote I chose was impossible. I'd heard this word before and pounded it like a hard, a hard coconut shell. Then I used the rich white flesh to make a cake. And I mm-hmm. think I think that describes Leela so well. And that's why I chose it. So I think, and I think that all that we've discussed has shown why this quote embodies Leela's character. Yeah. I just loved her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we are going to move on to our pairings. And Ashley, will you start? With your pairing? Sure. So this is one, this was one of my very first YA reads when I moved here to Virginia. And it was one that Jen shared with me. And I had read virtually no romance books prior to this <laughs> and and had quite a bias against them. I've talked before about how I'm sorry now for the prejudice that I carried against genres because I now understand that all genres have a place and that it there's still some I don't love, like thrillers, for example, I don't absolutely love, but I have come to understand that one kind is not better than another kind. But I definitely had that attitude, which I think is important to acknowledge. So just because I wish I hadn't, but I did. And now I've learned and I'm grateful. So (laughs) this is one of the ones that has changed that changed my attitude. And it's Stephanie Perkins, Anna and the French Kiss. And I that was the first one I read of hers, but I have read all of her others. And I think that what this one has in common is that Anna is excited to go into her senior year of high school, but she is sent to a boarding school in Paris against her will, and she has to adjust to that reality. And so there is definitely that similarity of this is not what she wanted. She had a future planned and this was not that plan. And so like Leela, who gets sent to England and is desperate to come back home, we see a lot of that with Anna. But similarly, as she stays there, she discovers she meets Etienne and he has a lot of He has a complicated relationship with his family and a lot that he's working through. But as they get to know each other better, she comes to see the beauty in where she is, the joy in discovering a new place. And I think all of that is really well done. So I've shared about this one a little bit in the past, and it has been a while since I've read it. But I think that there's a strong similarity as far as figuring out who you are in relationship to being put in a new environment where you have to find your way. And so that definitely happens for Anna here. And I just love Stephanie Perkins. I think that her work is really fun, but also deals with some heavy issues in a way. Some of the style I think is similar to this one in the sense that there are heavy things to work through, but the characters are working through them in a way that is believable and that is a rich reading experience. So again, that's Stephanie Perkins, Anna and the French Kiss. I like that one too. That was one of Ashley's recommendations for me in a prior episode that, that, and I read it and I really thought that was a sweet book. I liked it a lot. That book made me giddy when I read it. It's so, uh, I just love it. (laughs) (laughs) Jen, what is your pairing? So I picked Amy Spaulding's We Used to Be Friends, and I read this one as part of a buddy read as well. It is a book. I chose this because it is about the end of a a high school friendship as the girls are getting ready to graduate. It covers really the whole of their senior year, but it reminded me of Leela and Stephanie's friendship. There are certainly differences, but I think it does a good job of acknowledging both how important friends are to us and the way that sometimes we change and grow away from each other. And this one, I listened to this one on audio and I really loved it. It has, so it's told from both girls perspectives and it alternates between chapters with different narrators and both narrators are amazing. But the really unusual thing about it is that one story, Kat's story moves forward through their senior year. So you start at the beginning, Kat and James, James is a girl also, are best friends. 
and you see Kat's world changing as she moves forward. And James's story starts at the end of their senior year when they are no longer friends and her story works backwards. And so you see, it, it's really interesting because Spalding uses that to show the exact same scene from their two perspectives. And you see how one girl interpreted what was happening in this way. And then the other one saw things completely differently. I will say, I think this is a heavier book than A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea and Tomorrow. The last chapter of the book, I was absolutely sobbing because you have reached the point where you see and understand what they have lost. And so there are parts of it that are really heartbreaking, but I really appreciated the way there are romances in the book as well, but they are really not the focus. The focus is on this central friendship. And you see some of the same journeys that Leela's going on, understanding that your best friend doesn't have to be your only friend, things like that. But also just that the loss of that friendship is impactful and it's not something I think sometimes we brush aside friendship in in favor of romance when we look at YA books. And so this is one that didn't do that at all, which I really liked. But yeah, get ready. Get your get your tissues out. I mean, it (laughs) it is really poignant in places. So now you all want to read it right now because we're in such a good place. (laughs) Sarah, what's your pairing? So I'm going to go with Elizabeth Acevedo's with the fire on high. And we actually had did a, an mm-hmm. book club episode on this book. It's on episode 89. Holy moly. We're on 180. And that was episode 89. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. But, <laughs> it doesn't seem that long ago, but um, I thought this was a great pairing for a Cuban girl's guide to tea and tomorrow, because there is a central, very strong, female, young adult, female character, Imani Santiago, at the heart of this story. She has a really, she actually has a really, really strong relationship with her abuela. Her her abuela is her guardian, basically. And so they have this really strong relationship. And Imani has this really amazing impact on the food that she makes. So she is an aspiring chef. So I thought that there were a lot of similarities. There are a lot of differences too, to a Cuban girl's guide to tea and tomorrow. But I thought that there, this would make a really lovely pairing. And if you liked a Cuban girl's guide, I'm just going to go with the shorter name. (laughs) You will, I think you will enjoy with the fire on high there. Like a Cuban girl's guide. There is a, there is a romance, but it's not, it's, it's not, what you take from that story. I think it's the family and the importance of finding yourself and making your own way and blazing your own path. That is at the heart of this story, which I feel like is also at the heart of Leela's story in A Cuban Girl's Guide. And Imani is just a great character. She has a daughter. And so that's a really rich component of this story about how she's navigating high school and being a mom and all the the requirements that come with that. I just think that both of these provide a really good, awesome food descriptions. And then also the relationships between family and how you make your way. So I think that's with the fire on high by Elizabeth Acevedo makes a really good pairing to a Cuban girl's guide. I think that's a great. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that Sarah, but that is a perfect pairing. (laughs) Okay. Before we wrap up our discussion of a Cuban girl's guide to tea and tomorrow, we are going to go with our bookish hearts and Ashley, what, how many bookish hearts do you give this book? No surprise to people who've been listening. I give it five, all the star, all the hearts, but five bookish hearts. How about you, Jen? Yep, five for me too. And we I will round that out with five from me because I thought this was an excellent, excellent YA book. And I'm so happy that we chose it for book club and also for our buddy read this month. I'm excited to discuss it. All right, before we end, we came up with this topic, but we did not realize how much we were going to be near tears throughout this whole episode. So our give me one is a movie or TV show that made you cry. Jen, what is yours? I have a short list. And then as Sarah and Ashley were adding their short lists also, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, those two. But I will just pick one. So I really, really loved Nomadland. And 
It is a very quiet movie if you have not seen it. It is based on a nonfiction book of the same name, but the movie just brings that book to vivid life. And Frances McDormand plays Fern, a woman who, after her husband dies, she is traveling the country in essentially her van and joins other people who are doing the same. And there are a couple of scenes in that movie that thinking about right now, I could just start sobbing and... They are sad, but also beautiful. I think there's a sense in the movie that they are condensing their lives to what really matters in some sense, which makes the things that matter all that much more resonant. I, if you have not watched it, I could not recommend it more. It's award-winning now over and over and over, but it is really brilliant. So Nomadland makes me, makes me cry. I haven't watched that yet, but I know that it's gotten a lot of accolades. It's amazing. It is amazing. Oh. Ashley, what is yours? So I got this from a recommendation for, from Sarah. I watched the Netflix series, Never Have I Ever, which I absolutely loved. And I also, I had a list as well as Jen, but I wanted to share this one because I think it is also YA in the sense that I think it's a good fit. If you're loving this, if you loved this book, I think that this series has some similarities as far as like development of character and things like that and complex family relationships, those kinds of things. So this one centers Devi. She's in high school. She lost her father the year before, and he died suddenly of a heart attack in a pretty public way. So then her everybody at her school is very aware of that, and she experienced some trauma related to that that then impacted her connections to people at high school, and she's trying really hard to recover that and to make her way in a totally new way at her high school. And it is hilarious, but oh my gosh, I shed some tears. Mm -hmm. And because I just thought it was beautiful, it was absolutely beautiful. And I thought that the ending of that first season could not have been more perfect. So I just highly recommend it. I think it was an amazing series. I can't wait to watch the second season. So well done. I love the friend groups. I love the way that she's navigating friendships as she also wants to grow up on her own as a person and then all the family dynamics. So definitely made me cry. Also a great fit as far as like has some similar things going on to this book. So what about you, Sarah? What's your pick? Yeah, I love Never Have I Ever. I don't cry a ton in books, but when I watch something, the tears come. So I have cried in a myriad of different <laughs> different shows and movies. But when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about what is the first movie that, I, that you know, made me sob and it just like impacted me in this huge way. And so that movie for me was Steel Magnolias. I love that movie so much. I love the relationship between the women. But when Julia Roberts's character dies, Shelby, when she dies, I mean, I was a mess. Like I wanted to lay on the floor and just sob because, and I think, I mean, I watched it when I was fairly young and I had just never, I hadn't experienced great loss yet. And I mean, in that movie, like it made me feel that great loss. So it's still Magnolias, but I did one on Jen's list. She has the 100, which is streaming on Netflix. And I have to say, there's one episode in season one that made me like, I have not cried in a show like that since. I was a wreck. I mean, I just could not get myself under control. So the 100 in my adult life <laughs> is so <laughs> because for one one main reason is because in the last year and a half I have avoided all things that might make me cry. <laughs> so the 100 is also an excellent choice. All right. Well, we would if you would like to share with us, we would love to know a movie or TV <laughs> show that made you cry and or feel all the feels. And you you can hit us up on social media. We will have a post on the Monday after this episode that will give you a chance to share those in our feed. And we would love to know those ones that made you laugh, made you cry. And then hopefully sometime we will go with what made us laugh. <laughs> We hope that you read A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea in tomorrow and join in the discussion on social media. And if you'd like to join our buddy read, we would love to have you for that. So just hit us up on Instagram, DM us, and we will be happy to add you there. And thanks for listening.
Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Underbridge Pod or on the web at underbridgepod.com for a list of ways to support us. We'd like to thank Jared Featherstone, who composed our theme music, Strings of Light, and Katie Amy of Amy Photography, our podcast photographer. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.